Jonathan Friedberg from Rochester, uh, New York. You have to distinguish Rochester, New York, and um, Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, I know that there are even patients who sometimes go yes. <laughs> off at the wrong airport. <laughs> to, to the wrong place. <laughs> Ours is the big Rochester. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, this is a challenge to try to summarize uh, four or five days worth of material in, in a short period of time. And there were a lot of very exciting uh, clinical discussions. Uh, summarizing um, uh, this in, as far as thematically, I think that, put simply, this is a great time in, in lymphoma clinical research. We're, we're at a time, really, uh, we have a wealth of riches to choose from uh, as far as novel agents, probably more novel agents and more potential combinations than we even have patients. And that, that's a wonderful time for us. And I think what we've seen at this meeting are a number of studies that look to refine novel therapies. Uh, that refinement might include alternative schedules, alternative doses, and novel combinations. One of the challenges I think was highlighted at a session uh, of this meeting is that when you put some of these novel agents together, you do see some unexpected toxicities. And I think it, it pushes all of us to be cautious that even though many of the novel agents are very well tolerated by themselves, there can be unexpected toxicities that occur when they're combined. And I think that will have implications on how we develop these combinations moving forward. I think uh, the result of uh, these investigations that we've seen here will likely be uh, larger randomized trials of these novel combinations in certain disease settings. So with that thematic introduction, uh, there were a few abstracts that I think are likely to potentially change practice in the near future, and some of these we really heard for the first time at this meeting. Uh, one of them was a large randomized trial conducted in the United Kingdom called the <coughs> RATHL, R-A-T-H-L trial. This was a trial in Hodgkin lymphoma that explored uh, treating patients based on the result of PET scanning. And this concept of uh, response-adapted treatment has been around for a few years, the idea being that if you respond uh, quickly to, to chemotherapy, you're likely to do better than if you don't. And we may be able to pick out patients early who aren't responding optimally to chemotherapy and change their treatment. Uh, the main emphasis of the RATHL trial, though, was to look at patients who responded quickly to standard ABVD chemotherapy and explore whether taking one of the drugs out called bleomycin could be safely done. And the reason why that's important is that bleomycin can cause lung injury and uh, have a risk of death in, in a low percentage of patients. And with hundreds of patients enrolled on this randomized trial, it did appear that you could safely remove bleomycin after the second cycle of ABVD. And whether physicians will uh, do this immediately, I, I don't know if that's clear. I think oftentimes we wait for the manuscript to come out to really understand the data. But in the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma, a common to uh, debatable topic is if somebody isn't doing well, how much pressure do I need to feel to keep going with the bleomycin? And I think we're going to see bleomycin eliminated uh, much earlier than it used to be, and hopefully that will improve the ultimate outcome for patients. So that was a very important abstract. A second one in Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, literally uh, an hour ago, <laughs> so hot off the press, uh, was uh, the, the first results of the H10 trial, the final results, that again was looking at this response-adapted type of treatment, but this time focusing on patients who were PET positive, and they uh, looked at the role of Bayacop, uh, a more aggressive chemotherapy in that subset of patients with early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma, and did show a benefit of that uh, compared to standard treatment. So there are a number of ongoing and uh, completed trials where we're waiting for results, but I think that we're beginning to see that this response-adaptive technique is likely going to be the way we move forward in Hodgkin lymphoma. So I think that's an important conclusion of this meeting. 
another area that, that I think may change practice relatively quickly were the results of a large uh, cooperative effort uh, from Italy looking at primary central nervous system lymphoma. This is an uncommon disease that uh, historically has had dismal outcome, although outcomes are improving. And this was a two-part trial, but the first part was presented here where they looked at three different induction regimens and showed that the addition of thiotipa and rituximab to standard uh, methotrexate and cytarabine had not only uh, response benefit, but overall survival benefit. And I think it always gets our attention early when we see overall survival benefit. Thiotipa is a drug that is not used very often in the United States. It's not so easy to get, and I think it's going to likely change practice. I think the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, we saw some refinement of the data that had been initially presented uh, in the New England Journal. And in, in response to the question that was asked a, a few minutes ago, uh, comparing lymphoma to the solid tumors, one of the points that was made at this meeting is that if nivolumab, one of the uh, checkpoint inhibitors, the highest response rates are seen in Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, much higher than melanoma, much higher than lung cancer. Uh, the response rates are roughly double. Uh, so although the, the, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiasm because the, the bar might be somewhat lower in showing benefit in, in solid tumors, I think these drugs really will have a future in lymphoma subtypes. And I think the presentation that we saw uh, looking at the longer-term follow-up of patients on the nivolumab trials only increases our enthusiasm because it's demonstrating that the responses are durable. Um, and I think that that's uh, likely going to be rapidly moved earlier in the course of treatment of diseases like Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as exploring various combinations. And as, as many of you know, there are a number of these agents uh, that are currently under development by several different pharmaceutical companies. And that does give, I think, opportunities for some very unique and novel combinations. Uh, the only other study that um, I wanted to emphasize as far as potentially practice changing, or at least potentially leading to an FDA uh, approval in the United States, is the Gadolin trial. This was presented at ASCO. And we're going to hear uh, another version of this presentation, I think, this afternoon. Uh, this is a trial that uh, looked at uh, bendamustine alone versus bendamustine and obinutuzumab with obinutuzumab maintenance in a group of patients that they defined as being refractory to rituximab with follicular lymphoma. So it's a narrow uh, group of patients. And uh, they showed a substantial improvement in progression-free survival, no difference in overall survival. And I think the study still needs to be dissected on how important the induction treatment versus the maintenance treatment was. But there are some investigators who feel this is the beginning of a proof of principle that we may be able to rescue patients who are refractory to one CD20 antibody by using a different uh, CD20 antibody. And I'm mentioning that because it's likely the way this study was designed that it will lead to FDA approval in the United States. The last thing I thought I would just mention, and I think it's a nice way to, to end the, the remarks because it, it comes back to what Ricardo was saying, is that many of us spent all day on Tuesday at a closed workshop in follicular lymphoma where um, scientists and, and biologists with specific uh, interest in this disease were sitting together with clinicians. And I think that the product of that was an appreciation of the scientific complexity, but also the progress that's been made in understanding the way follicular lymphoma evolves and how um, you may have, uh, you know, predisposing risks to follicular lymphoma that can take decades until the disease actually evolves, and it's intriguing to think about how we might impact the disease early on. And I think a conclusion, or at least a consensus that came out of that, was that we clinically need to focus on a group of patients who have particular high risk in follicular lymphoma, because this is a disease where the majority of the patients are doing very well, but there remains a set of patients that don't do well. And we think, given the, the biologic understanding that Ricardo was uh, reviewing, that we're going to be able to start defining who these patients are up front, 
and there are international efforts that were discussed that are hopefully in the next couple of years going to lead us to have an ability to treat uh, follicular lymphoma in a precision approach where at diagnosis, a signature that may incorporate both clinical as well as uh, molecular criteria will allow us to define whether a patient is high risk or not, and the high risk patients would be treated differently from the standard risk patients. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, I just wanted perhaps to add one comment to your brilliant summary of the Hodgkin trials. Um, the, the importance uh, of the fact that uh, we had now the confirmation that PET adapted therapy will mo most probably be the way in the future we will treat the patients is that uh, today we have very good results. We achieve very good results in, in the treatment of Hodgkin uh, lymphomas. Uh, but the, the main problem there uh, remains the fact that at least till now, that after 10 to 12 years, um, second tumors, which are therapy-related, or uh, deaths because of uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases, which are also therapy-related, uh, are uh, more common than relapses of the disease. So if we want to uh, um, improve clearly further uh, the outcome, the first thing that we have to do is that to avoid uh, late complications. And uh, most probably PET adapted therapy will um, allow us uh, not to over treat the majority uh, of uh, the patients over treatment, which is leading then to this late uh, toxicity and to more deaths than basically later on because of relapses of the disease. So 